welcome everyone. Welcome to Health and Wellness in the Age of Quarantine. Next slide. So we are the Center for the Women of New York. I'll be your host today, Victoria Pilati. And uh, I wish you all health and wellness. And I'm sure we're going to learn quite a bit today from our expert panelists. And um, if you've missed our previous webinars, you can contact us at events at cwny.org. That's E-V-E-N-T-S at cwny.org in case you're a, a dial-in participant. And please do subscribe to our newsletter on our website. Next slide. So since uh, October of 1987, the center has shown that, working, that women working together can be an effective force. We are a voluntary nonprofit and we depend on dues and, and the efforts of our volunteers. Uh, we advocate strongly for women's full equality by partnering with like-minded uh, organizations. At the Center of the Women of New York, we believe in education as a cornerstone for independence. And uh, you can check out our website for the various classes and services we offer. Whether we're marching for worthy causes celebrating women's accomplishments, camaraderie is a hallmark of the Center for the Women of New York. We've come a long way since the second wave of the women's rights movement. And while there are many struggles ahead, we love getting together to celebrate how far we've come. So a little housekeeping. We will be sending you a survey, and that is very important. We'd like to know how we can improve our educational offerings, and we'd like to know what we did well. And if you'd like a copy of the slides, they will be posted on our website uh, 15 minutes after the presentation at cwny.org slash past events. And we do want you to feel free to ask questions of our experts. And uh, at the end of the last presentation, uh, we will address your questions. You can write your questions in the chat box at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentations, and uh, they will be answered after the last presenter. If you dialed in, Please email your questions to, once again, events, E-V-E-N-T-S, at cwny.org. So many of us feel overwhelmed. The social distancing rules, the PPE rules, and uh, all that we hear on the news. Our expert panelists want you to know that you're not alone. And we hope that after today's webinar, you will feel less anxious and have less stress in your life. And we hope that we bring you happiness. Our speakers today are Mariana Zara, psychotherapist and certified recovery coach, Izzy Jacobus, certified nutritionist, certified trainer, and Paige Bellenbaum, founding director of the Motherhood Center of New York. Our agenda, stress and anxiety, nutrition and exercise, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, and uh, each of the presenters will give us coping mechanisms, tips and strategies. So for our first presenter, mental health, Mariana Zara. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mariana Zara, and I'm happy to be here with you today to talk about mental health in the age of quarantine and post pandemic. I want to thank the Center for the Women of New York for this platform and opportunity to be with you today. So uh, mental health is always about coming to terms with a new reality. 
we have been thrust into a new reality without our permission from COVID. And so what this looks like for you today and what we can talk about is what you're currently experiencing and ways that we can develop healthy coping skills to get through it. Developing a construct I find helpful to be able to start to, to visualize what that's like for you. So what I do with my patients, which I find helpful, is create uh, a construct of a toolbox. And you can call it your tips for mental health, if you like, if that helps. So the questions you want to be asking is, what does that look like? What do you want to put in it? And what really matters to you? These are questions of personal choice. And this is where your power lies, lies in your power of choice. I do want to um, address and acknowledge the psychodynamic underlying issues associated with depression, bipolar, PTSD, and mental illness on a whole. Unfortunately, they're predicting a rise in mental illness. So I wanna let you know additional resources are available. They will be posted at the end of the presentation. You can contact your primary physician, if you have a current mental health professional, um, I will be available. Uh, that information will also be posted if you need to reach out and you need some information. As well as if this is an emergency, please call 911. They're always available to come and, uh, for immediate emergencies for you. So each of us are having a very personal experience with quarantine and social distancing. Maybe you have a pre-existing health issue that now feels unmanageable, that requires ongoing treatment and medication. Maybe you're struggling with some financial concerns and preoccupation with worry about that or experiencing personal strained relationships, unsafe housing situations. Or perhaps maybe you're using alcohol, drugs, food in excess and self-destructive behaviors. We can't ignore the collective anxiety that we're all experiencing as a result of saturated news and negative self-talk. Maybe you're preoccupied with a first responder or a frontline worker that you know that is in constant contact. Or perhaps you know someone who's ill from COVID or some other illness or grieving the loss of someone you love and know as a result of COVID or some other illness. That process itself takes time. And I welcome you again to receive additional help, certainly, to give yourself that time. Loss is emotional. Loss can also be uh, around an expectation or a hope or a plan that we've had, the way life is supposed to be going right now, that everything's been put to halt. It's important with mental health to be able to identify our feelings, not just the circumstances that we're going through. So some of the feelings we might be going through, the more distressing negative feelings, anxiety, fear, sadness, anger, loneliness, and these are just a few. Circumstances and feelings affect our thoughts. They begin to challenge our belief systems, our decision-making and our overall behavior, all of which seriously compromise your emotional and physical health. At the very least, causing obstacles to your daily wellness throughout your day with those yourself and those around you. The good news is statistics prove that wellness and healthy coping skills decrease blood pressure, minimize health issues, reduce stress and anxiety, and increase overall immune support. So as we look at strategies and coping skills, and some you may have already started and some you might want to expand on, and this might be absolutely new to you. So everyone there's something for everybody. We need to create a space to allow positive flowing messages. 
to uh, allow them in. So what I encourage strongly as fundamental are two words, attitude and perception. Our attitude and perception or your outlook on a problem will significantly affect the attitude and perception of the solution. So I'd like to take a look at the slide um, up on your screen by Viktor Frankl. Okay, so on the slide on your screen is a quote from Viktor E. Frankl, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning. Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances to choose one's own way, emphasizing power of choice and your attitude. So I wanted to like to move on to the next slide. This, I refer to this as a hope and wellness chart, a tool that you can use as reference as you move through different phases of your mental health wellness. So let's take a look at this. We're gonna spend a little time on this. Um, the question, who do I wanna be during COVID-19? And I'm gonna add post-pandemic. Most of us are living in the fear zone, flooded with negative messages, moment to moment feelings. And as we begin to shift our attitude and our perception, of the problem, we move into the learning zone. The learning zone is where we begin to open our minds and our awarenesses and be willing to make the changes from those feelings, those distressing feelings we identified that exist in the fear zone. As we move into the growth zone, this is the how to, this is where it requires your participation on um, your engaging in your own mental wellness. Okay, so the how-tos of that. Um, in, and I'm gonna keep this on the screen because these statements are reflective of what we're gonna be discussing. Three main areas I wanna talk about are the power of words, planned activities, and mindfulness. Okay, the power of words. There's lots of studies on this that when we begin to change the language we use and the words we think of, it changes the brain's receiving mode. And it actually can promote more feelings of well being. For example, when fear meets courage, courage is not the absence of fear. It is action despite our fears. When motivation meets anxiety, we're gonna talk about that a little later. Um, move a muscle, change a thought. I know and I recognize this is not so easy for everybody. So it is doable within the range of your ability. There's no race here. This is your personal, personal mental health wellness that you're creating. Um, we, I want to talk about, in terms of feelings of anger, how compassion and understanding automatically diffuse anger. Reaching out fills the void of loneliness and isolation. That could be reaching out to a professional for help, could be reaching out in service. Gratitude is transformative. It turns hopelessness to hope. I, myself, write a gratitude list every day, five things I'm grateful for, takes one minute. Connection soothes and supports loss. An integral word encompassing so much of the growth zone that we are aiming towards is resilience, the capacity to bounce back from difficulties. So now we look at some new words, attitude, perception, hope, wellness, motivation, courage, compassion, gratitude, connection, resilience, reaching out. All of these words you can put in your toolbox or in your vision of mental health and begin to 
look at them and reflect at the meaning they have for you. These are, this promotes empowerment and well-being. Okay, so planned activities as coping skills. What's necessary for mental health is devoting the time to it. Structuring some rhythm in your day that you're gonna to dedicate to your mental health wellness. Make it simple and doable. If you can't remember, and this is new to you, you can put this in your phone as an alarm. It could look something like five minutes three times a day, 30 minutes twice a day, 60 minutes once a day. It really doesn't matter. Again, it's up to you to tailor your own plan for mental health. I can't stress that enough because everybody's at different places. Um, so some planned activities that you may already be doing or you want to reintroduce yourself to or expand on would be something like writing, reading, artwork, singing. I myself have taken to singing out loud, <laughs> um, gardening. And if you're living in, in an apartment, uh, which I have many, many, for many years, I had potted plants and get into gardening, um, cooking, and learning about your relationship with food, exercise. You can download free apps, the exercise and yoga, um, expanding your spiritual life. This is a good opportunity for those who are looking for uh, an inner resource or expanding what that means for them. These telehealth resources, slash like the one we're on today, Zoom meetings, people are using them for celebrations now and an opportunity to get together and connect. The mental health community, the 12-step community are using them as a source of support and camaraderie. My own 22-year-old daughter initiated a Zoom meeting, open mic night, where there's poetry slam and creative artistic expressions going on. So these, these are activities that induce positive feelings and begin to minimize and reduce and can eliminate eventually the negative feelings. They're healthy coping skills. The third one, which is really important and we hear a lot about is mindfulness. During this time of quarantine, isolation, um, and limitations, there's this huge cloud of unknowing. When are we going to be able to take off our masks? When are things going to be normal again? Um, and as well, the time we spend in the past about the way things were. Staying in the present is your strongest position and your choice point of beginning your mental health. Mindfulness is is a technique along with some others, grounding, affirmations, meditation, and some visualizations I'm gonna address. Mindfulness is actually turning, and I do this as a visual, visualizing, turning your attention to what you're saying and what you're doing. Right now, being mindful that you are here present in this webinar. The grounding technique are those uh, techniques that we use, we use our senses to be able to observe and bring ourselves back to the present moment. Our hearing, sight, um, smell, taste, touch. Examples of this in practical action would be, let's say one of your planned activities is getting back into nature and you're out for a walk. And you're now practicing your mindfulness about the pace of your movements, perhaps, or looking up in the sky and gazing at the clouds and noticing the shape of the clouds or listening to the, the birds or whatever is going on in your environment. And by turning your attention to these activities automatically reduces the anxiety in the moment. It could be if you can't get outside, if you're inside cooking, for the smell of the food, the taste of the food. Today, we're not getting a lot of touch. When you're washing your hands, take an extra minute and observe the feel of the water on your fingers or the smell of the soap you're using and, and or if you touch your hands with your face in the morning and wash your face. All of these sound really simple, 
but we, we don't think about them. And mindfulness is about bringing those thoughts to your attention. What we give attention to builds momentum. Affirmations. Affirmations, you can reflect back on the growth chart. You can see those uh, affirmations there. You can also use the uh, I am statements. And if you're brave, you can do this in the mirror. I recommend it. Otherwise, it's okay. Things, um, maybe phrases like I am whole and loved. I am recreating my life. In hope, I am fearless over and over again. Um, uh, I want to talk about visualizations. You can get a guided meditation, download them on YouTube. They're all, uh, it's easy to be able, or you can bring yourself, I'm sorry, uh, you bring yourself back to a uh, visual memory that is pleasing, and that will induce pleasant feelings. Meditation. Now, important not to overcomplicate this if this is new. For you it's about really beginning to get in touch with your breath and there's a simple meditation a 16 second breath exercise that i highly recommend breathing in for four seconds holding it for four seconds breathing out for four seconds and holding it out for four seconds if you do this 20 times it takes five minutes I also, myself, incorporate breathing with my affirmations, and I highly recommend that with my patients as well. We do it together. Breathing in calm, breathing out anxiety. Breathing in let, and breathing out go. The more that you practice these techniques, the more aware you will be of your feelings, like an internal compass and how to be, get back on course. Everything takes practice. You can incorporate one activity, one new concept or idea. You have begun your mental health wellness plan. Um, as you fortify and strengthen your inner life and come to your new terms of your reality, you can add, delete, explore more options about what feels good for you. Not to just fix what's broken or to heal what hurts, but to be the best version of you. I want to let you know today that we are all essential. All of our experiences, our pain, and our suffering can help somebody else. And that's what we need right now is to help each other. I hope that we can have an open mind and soften our hearts to receive new information. Because one day, our story of COVID will be a memory, a time in history where we will talk about this common problem, universal feelings, and how we found meaning in it all. And that is the essence of mental health. It's going through the process, finding your new reality that feels right for you, and finding meaning in that. So I hope this has been helpful today and, and thank you so much for your time. Izzy J Jacobus is a certified nutrition coach and a certified personal trainer and he will speak to us on, um, on nutrition and self-care. Izzy? Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all well and safe. I'd like to thank the Center for the Women of New York for having me here to share some things with you. I'm going to be talking a bit about exercise and nutrition and general wellness topics, which might actually even relate to some of the information from Mariana. Um, before I, I start a short disclaimer, I am not a medical professional, I'm not a doctor, I am not a licensed dietitian or nutritionist, so none of this information is meant to supersede anything that you may get from your personal doctor or medical professional. This is advice, you can take it as you like. Many of the things that I'm going to be talking about to deliver very generally. If you need more, you can contact me at 
theworkout.com if you have any specific questions or you'd like additional information on that. Um, so I'd like to talk so about two, two separate things, um, two, two, two separate categories. One is general health promotion in any circumstance. Um, and then the other is related to the current pandemic that we are dealing with, how to uh, keep yourself safe and, uh, and, and, and you know, how to handle a possible eventual infection. And so while there is no definitive evidence that any sort of supplementation is beneficial for this particular virus, I think we know that certain supplements are beneficial for any of these type of situations. I'm gonna talk about a few of those and some general food recommendations. Uh, and I'll start there. So the main supplements that I think you should focus on if you're gonna be taking things to prepare yourself for a possible infection and to keep your immune system high are vitamin C, vitamin D, B-complex vitamins, and very specifically B12, and zinc. Um, and so vitamin D, of course, is an issue for us right now. We can't get outside. We usually get our vitamin D from the sun, and because we're not getting outside as much, um, and also because it's cold weather times, everybody in this area of the world should be supplementing vitamin D during winter. Um, it is important for respiratory health and it's necessary um, to, to keep your levels high. A good vitamin D supplement is a good idea. Um, let me backtrack and say I do not necessarily recommend multivitamins. I don't believe they're the best idea. Um, and also, before I continue on, I might want to tell you that it's always a good idea to have your levels checked by your doctor before you take any extreme supplementation on, um, as we want to be sure you're not overloading your body. Most of these supplements, you won't have that type of problem with, though. Vitamin C, of course, is also an important supplement at this time, reducing inflammation and the benefits that you can reap from it are important. Um, B vitamins also important. I want to stress B12 for everyone. A vast majority of the population is low in vitamin B12. About 40% of adults in America are significantly low in B12, and about 10% of all adults are dangerously low in B12. This is a water soluble vitamin. I suggest a sublingual supplement. So not something that you would swallow, but something that um, and zinc. Zinc helps produce and activate T cells, which is great to fight all kinds of infections. So those are the four supplements I recommend. Vitamin D, vitamin C, B complex, specifically B12 as well, and zinc. Beyond that, I want to talk a bit about general nutrition. So I am vegan. Um, I have many clients who are vegan and many who are not. Um, because of my ethics and morals, I do not recommend anything other than plant foods. Um, but even for my clients who don't eat an, a plants only diet, a plant based diet, um, as I tell them, I will tell you that it's fairly impossible to have optimal health while eating tons of animal products. So Anything that I tell you, if you're going to eat animal products, you can add those to whatever I tell you. But here is how, um, through my training and through my practice, I advocate health. Um, I studied under Joel Furman, who has an acronym called G-BOMBS, G-B-O-M-B-S. And so G-BOMBS stands for food groups in the order of greatest importance, starting at the beginning, and the first G stands for greens. Um, these are your, your most nutrient dense as far as micronutrients goes, great sources of calcium. So dark leafy greens, the most important thing in your diet, try to get them daily. 
G. The B stands for beans, which is great for vegans, of course, for protein, but for everyone um, as just as dark leafy greens, beans are also great cancer fighting foods and so great for protein, great for fiber. The O stands for onions, onions and garlic in this case, which are both from the Allium family. Um, these are also mega nutrient dense, right? Vitamin C, vitamin B, potassium, um, great for heart health, boost digestive health, all of those things. So onions and garlic are the O. The M is for mushrooms. Again, a great anti-cancer food. The next B is for berries. So berries are something I recommend for all of my bodybuilder clients and all of my fitness clients. These foods are the best fruits that you can eat in that classification. Lots of sugar, but so much fiber that it burns evenly and you won't have that insulin spike. They're great for alarm learning fuel, they're incredibly high in antioxidants, a superfood group if there ever was one. And the final letter in G-bombs is the S, stands for seeds and nuts. Now, of course, any type of seeds, but in particular, the small seeds, flax, chia, hemp. All of these seeds are great for fatty acids, particularly omega-3 fatty acids, right? And these are what you need to balance out the fats in your body. So G-bombs, this is how you figure out how to have healthy plant foods in your diet. Greens, beans, onions and garlic, mushrooms, berries, seeds and nuts. And so when we're talking about vitamin C, for instance, a lot of people think of an orange and citrus fruits are of course high in vitamin C, but Lots of foods are high in vitamin C and it's great for you to get all of the phytochemicals that come with vitamin C rather than just always taking the ascorbic acid pills that you get. So a sweet potato has as much vitamin C as an orange. Um, there's plenty of vitamin C in alliums, so onions and garlic. So again, G-bombs, G-B-O-M-B-S are greens, beans, onions and garlic, mushrooms, berries, seeds, and nuts. And so try to focus on getting these plant foods, as I said, from the top on down, the beginning of the acronym to the end, those are the foods of greatest importance. And so I wanna move on to something which might touch on the last presenter's information, which is self-care and general wellness. Um, a lot of people don't realize that Self-care and calm within you is incredibly important. Now, there's a lot of pseudoscience around about how to be well and how to use that to, to, to be healthy. But what people don't realize is, is some of that is based in evidence and science. I'm, 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 everything that I do is based in evidence. And the evidence shows that placebos and nocebos are important things, right? We know that in studies, placebo groups often reap the same benefits as the people receiving the actual protocol or, or intervention or medical tool by as 20 or 30%, up to even 70% of the placebo group sometimes reaps the same benefits just by believing and putting their body and their mind in a state of wellness. And I know it sounds hokey, but a nocebo is the opposite of a placebo, can work in the exact same way. And so the reason why it's not hokey is you have to understand that when you are stressed, when you, there are different types of stress in the world, right? There's environmental stresses, chemical stresses, which is this virus, um, and, and, and chemical stress, emotional stress, environmental stress, all of these things put you in a place where your, your fight or flight response is making it so that your body is is, is giving off all kinds of cortisol and adrenaline and more adrenaline and your gut health, your, your digestive system is not working properly. You need these things to be operating at optimal levels for you to not be, your body to not be expending resources in this fight or flight mode. So meditation, Deepak Chopra has lots of free meditations. You can 
put one on in the morning, it's a great way to start your day rather than watching the news all day. Being informed is great. Watching the news incessantly can stress you. Bring on emotional stresses that are not necessary. Put yourself with self-care practices in a place where you can heal yourself for an eventual possible infection. And in general, so that you can stay in a good, healthy, you know, state. Um, so think about ways to keep yourself in, 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 in a well status. Um, let's move on to exercise. The most important thing, even beyond the supplements um, and the foods that I was discussing, is lung health, lung strength. And so, of course, we're spending a lot of time at home. Um, you may be out for walks and maybe trying to exercise a bit, but most of us are not doing anywhere near enough. I'd like to encourage all of you to try to get a cardiovascular workout at home. Anything from burpees to circuit training can get your lungs working, get them functioning really well and really hard. Um, I am advising all of my clients right now, whether they have equipment at home or they don't have equipment, to do a circuit training routine. Push, as in push-ups. If you can't do a push-up, a modified push-up, or a push-up where you're leaning against the wall rather on the ground. Pulling, any form of rowing for your back muscles and your arms. Shoulder pressing, another pushing exercise. And then squats. So these four categories of exercise are the main compound exercises you should be focusing on to be sure that you're challenging your muscles and done in a circuit fashion without lots of rests in between, can get your lungs working and be sure that you're preparing yourself for that eventual infection. Lung strength is the most important thing, people. This thing affects your lungs and because you're doing a lot of sitting and because you're very sedentary at home, we wanna be exercising. So those four groups, again, pushing, pushing in this direction, lying on the ground, pushing with any weighted object that you have. If you only have one weighted object, these things can be done with one arm, one arm out to the side, one arm pushing. For your shoulders, same way, one arm pushing, one arm out to the side. If you have two together, any weighted objects can work. For your back, the third thing is pulling. So if you're bent over and you're rowing, any one weighted object can work. And then finally, variations of squats. These are full body workouts, compound exercises, right? That work many muscle groups, really get your blood flowing and really get your heart working, really get your lungs pumping. Try to get a big lung workout. Try to get your really breathing hard. This is the way to keep your lungs strong for a possible eventual infection. So the last thing I wanna talk about is some of the information that we know is extremely important for the eventual situation where you might contract the virus. Right, and this once again is about lung health. Um, what people don't realize is people think that our lungs are primarily expanding in the front of our body, when in fact they are mostly expanding in the back of our body, towards our back. So, here are my recommendations. If you contract this virus, do not lay down on your back and, and just be sedentary. Move and fight. Mental attitude, physically fighting this thing are incredibly important. Um, be sure that you're doing some breathing exercises. The best recommendations so far are deep, long breaths, holding for five seconds, a deep, long breath, holding for five seconds, and then a big cough at the end out of five of those. <coughs> big cough, right? Spending more time lying on your front than your back. Doing these deep breathing exercises, keeping your lungs going, keeping a positive mental attitude, not just laying around, fighting the infection. This is the best way that you can, you, you can you know, assert yourself and, and be sure that you're fighting this thing off. 
Be sure to eat good foods. Be sure to continue to exercise. Try not to be too sedentary. Work your lungs. Thank you, everybody. Once again, if you have specific questions, you'd like me to elaborate on any of these things, you can contact me at izzy at theworkoutplan.com. I have many online clients who I'm helping through this time. I'd be happy to help any of you with any quick questions or extensive training. Thank you, Izzy. Ron, if we could have Izzy's slide, the next one, yes. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, our next presenter is Paige Bellenbaum Bellen -Baum, with uh, the Motherhood Center of New York. Welcome, Paige. Thank you, Victoria. Um, it's a pleasure to be here on this gloomy, rainy day in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, uh, as Victoria mentioned, my name is Paige Bellenbaum, and I am the founding director of an organization called the Motherhood Center located in New York City in a bricks and mortar iteration. Um, we are still very young, we're three years old, um, and the Motherhood Center is really the first of its kind treatment facility, clinical treatment facility that provides clinical care and support to new and expecting mothers that are experiencing something that we refer to as perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. This is a very long-winded term. Um, the acronym for it is PMADS. And what most people actually know this to be and are familiar with uh, is postpartum depression. And now, um, you know, the growing um, amount of women that are also coming forward and talking about uh, postpartum anxiety and a number of other diagnoses and symptoms that new and expecting mothers experience in the perinatal period. So at the Motherhood Center, really our mission is to provide this clinical care, but also provide education through webinars and presentations and things like this to really get out and try and defeat the stigma that so many new and expecting mothers experience when they are having these profound feelings of depression and anxiety and other symptoms. Uh, next slide, please. So we're gonna be talking about PMADS today. Uh, next slide. Um, and this is uh, really one of the most important slides um, that's gonna help us understand exactly what PMADS are. So one thing that a lot of people don't recognize is how prevalent PMADS are, right? One in five women experience one of these different diagnoses in the perinatal period. And when I say perinatal, I'm talking during pregnancy and up to one year postpartum. 50% of all PMADs actually develop during pregnancy. So it's important to note that women who are pregnant also develop anxiety, depression, and other diagnoses during that period. So what do PMADs include? It's really an umbrella term. It includes perinatal depression, so during pregnancy and postpartum. This can look like low mood, sadness, helplessness, and hopelessness, perinatal anxiety, constant worry, intrusive thoughts, ruminating thoughts. Women will explain it as though they can't turn off their brain. I, I say it's kind of like a hamster wheel. Uh, perinatal OCD, this includes obsessive thoughts, rituals, um, avoidance of obsessive stimuli, perinatal PTSD, this includes tension, nightmares, flashback, um, and in rare instances, but very important to note, postpartum psychosis, which includes delusions, hallucinations, paranoia, um, appearing very disorganized. This is a very important um, set of symptoms that require immediate hospitalization um, and 911 attention. Next slide, please. So why are PMADs important? As I mentioned, one in five women experience a PMAD during pregnancy or postpartum. But what, for those of us who do this work, we know it's actually more like one in three. And why this is so critical right now is because during this pandemic, a lot of the risk factors that contribute to developing a PMAD during pregnancy and postpartum are kind of the new norm. Isolation, being <clears throat> away from our social network, feeling this kind of constant set of sense of worry and lack of control about everything that's going on in the world around us. This is the new normal for new and expecting moms that who many of, you know, if you follow the news, there's a period of time there where <clears throat> when women were delivering, they weren't even able or 
allowed to bring their partner into the room, right? Like they were delivering with masks on by themselves. So this, this, this confluence of things that, that new and expecting moms are experiencing right now is really exacerbating um, their, their emotional wellness. And we're seeing a real spike in mental health symptoms emerging with this particular population. Uh, 80% of cases for PMADs go undiagnosed. And this has everything to do with A, just the general stigma around mental health, unfortunately, in this country, but in particular, maternal mental health. You know, uh, for those of us that um, are parents, I am the proud parent of two, also um, experienced severe postpartum depression and anxiety after my son was born. You know, there's this, this myth um, that we're all kind of fed as new and expecting moms of like, this is gonna be the most wonderful, amazing thing that's ever happened to me. I'm gonna feel this automatic bond and love for my baby. I'm gonna feel nothing but bliss and, and unconditional love. And I think maybe 5% of the population experiences that, but the other 95 might experience some of that but also experience a lot of other emotions and symptoms that don't particularly fit into that blissful category. And so when women start to feel like they're not connected with their baby, or they feel as though they, might, they, might, they made a mistake, that they miss their old life, um, that they wanna buy a one-way ticket and, and, and move away and escape this, this new family unit that they've created, they feel so guilty and ashamed of these feelings that they keep them inside. And so, so many women, do keep this a secret and then sadly don't receive the treatment that's available out there, which is really easily accessible and, and super effective to start to feel better and mitigate some of these symptoms. 40% uh, of low-income women experience a PMAT in the perinatal period. Um, women of color, low-income women of color at much greater risk. Um, as we talked, 50% uh, of these PMADs developed during pregnancy. PMADs are the number one complication associated with childbirth right? We hear about gestational diabetes and all kinds of other preeclampsia and these physical conditions that women experience in the perinatal period, but PMADs are the number one complication associated with childbirth. And yet when women are tested for some of these other um, physical elements that transpire in, during some pregnancies, very few OBGYNs and pediatricians actually test women and screen women for the possibility of PMADs. And, you know, if they do go untreated, they can lead to poor mother-baby attachment, developmental delays in children. So it is so important to catch these early on and treat them. PMADs are the number two reason for maternal uh, mortality rates, sadly, in the US. And in the most severe cases, if uh, PMADs go untreated, they can lead to suicide or infanticide. Next slide, please. So there are risk factors, and I alluded to, to some of these earlier, many of which are unfortunately the new normal. But first and foremost, if a woman has a history of mental illness, either herself or a family member, this does put her at a greater risk of developing a PMAD. Stressful life events and circumstances, finances, relationships, physical sexual abuse, substance use, recent or unresolved loss, coronavirus, um, these are things that can definitely contribute to the development of PMAD symptoms. If a mom is becoming a mom for the second or third time, if she had a PMAD in one of her previous perinatal periods, she's at a 50 to 75% chance um, of a repeat, a repeat onset. Unplanned or unwanted pregnancies and traumatic birth and NICU experiences can also be external risk factors that contribute to PMAD symptoms. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the offerings that the Motherhood Center is providing in this time of coronavirus for perinatal women. Like many, many organizations, um, we, we jumped as quickly as we could to bring all of our offerings virtually uh, available. So everything is being offered by Zoom. Um, I never thought that, that, uh, that clinical mental health care could be transported into a digital platform, but we're learning that it can be as many other things can be. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what we, we currently offer. And I wanna say we're offering these services to women all over the US. We used to be more confined by state lines, but a lot of the mental health laws have become very relaxed lately so that people can receive treatment whether they live in the state of New York or in another state in the US. Next slide, please. So we at the Motherhood Center have a virtual day program that is unlike really any other facility nationwide. 
Um, as I mentioned, you know, the goal of what we do is to provide clinical treatment. And when most people think of treatment, they think of outpatient therapy, seeing a therapist, going to a psychiatrist for medication. Um, those are things that we do provide at the Motherhood Center, but we also have a day program that is a very extensive wraparound treatment modality um, that's really tailored for women that are having very, very severe symptoms. Our bricks and mortar iteration, which I'll show you a few picture of, pictures of at the end of this, we have an on-site nursery, we have a, a big group room with very comfortable chairs for new moms to hold their babies, to breastfeed, to pump. Um, and, and basically, in the day program, we're providing these different modules of clinical treatment and support five days a week, five hours a day. So it's a step down from inpatient and it's a step up from outpatient. So it's this intermediate level of care. So moms start off the day at 10 a.m. They join us for a check-in. And in the virtual day program, we typically have anywhere from 10 to 15 women that are in that cohort. Um, we then learn, we learn um, a whole host of skills, uh, different modalities and treatment skills to help them combat um, the symptoms that they're experiencing. We do dyadic groups where moms are learning how to interact with, attach, and bond with their babies. Um, I'm going to get into the day program in a little bit of greater detail later on, but it really is this individualized level of care. And the beauty of it is, is it gives women a sense of community and it helps them feel better faster. Uh, and we being mindful of the fact that there's a lot of financial concerns going on in the U.S. today and beyond, we have significantly reduced our cost um, to participate in the day program because we recognize that so many women need this level of care right now. Next slide, please. So, you know, in the, de in the day program, I touched on some of this, three of the primary components that we are providing to women every day, skills development, uh, interventions, as I mentioned, to increase bonding and attachment with baby. You know, this, this is new moms. They don't feel connected to their baby and they feel terrible about it. And so um, what is called dyadic therapy, um, we have some specialists who specialize in dyadic therapy and are really able to help that, that new mom feel a greater sense of connection and love um, and compassion towards their new baby. And medication management, we have a number of reproductive psychiatrists on staff. They specialize in meds in pregnancy and postpartum. So they know what antidepressants and other medications are safe and effective to take in the perinatal period. We also have licensed clinicians, social workers, psychologists, postdocs, all of whom specialize in perinatal mental health. Next slide, please. Uh, and so everybody who uh, is, is admitted into the day program, as I mentioned, is experiencing moderate to severe symptoms of depression, anxiety, OCD, PTSD, bipolar, um, and in, in some instances, psychosis. Um, common symptoms can include passive suicidal ideation, obsessive ruminations, having these, these thoughts over and over again. Sleep and appetite disturbance is a really big one. Uh, disrupted attachment, as I mentioned, depressed mood, crying most of the day, um, having panic attacks, irritability. This is, this is a, one um, very prevalent symptom of PMADS is this irritability, this anger and rage um, that oftentimes women who are experiencing it have never had that at baseline before. So it's a very a new experience for them. It's very unsettling. And scary thoughts, um, this is something that 80% of all new mothers experience. Scary thoughts are these thoughts that will pop into a new mom's head of harm coming to the baby, right? Like, you know, what we hear very commonly is one scary thought is, I'm afraid I'm going to drop my baby down the stairs. I'm afraid I'm going to, to throw my baby out the window. I'm afraid to be in the kitchen around anything sharp because I'm afraid something might happen to my baby. And it's they, these thoughts, they, they just pop in and in and in, and they're so unsettling for moms. And so many new moms keep them to themselves because they, they can't believe that they're having these thoughts. But then when they do share and the entire room is like, oh yeah, I had a thought just like that. Oh yeah, yeah, I had that one. It's this relief of like, oh my God, I'm not alone. I'm not this crazy, horrible mother who's the only person having this experience. There's other women that I can relate to that are going through this too. Next slide, please. 
So the main goals of the day program are to stabilize these symptoms, um, to prevent inpatient hospitalizations. We get a lot of women who um, come to us from inpatient facilities because their symptoms are so severe, providing step-down care, um, reducing acute symptoms, and returning patients to an adequate level of functioning, increasing their coping skills to decrease impaired functioning and judgment, to address that attachment and bonding between mom and baby that I've mentioned, and to really stabilize the family system during this vulnerable period of adjustment to new roles. When a mom is not well and she's in this state of experiencing a PMAT, it impacts everybody in the family. It impacts her relationship with her baby, her partner, her friends, everybody in her support network. So stabilizing that fam family system and unit is imperative. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of some of the different types of therapeutic modalities that we integrate into the day program. Um, interpersonal therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy. This probably might sound like kind of a mumble jumble to some people. So just to kind of abbreviate it a little bit, um, really teaching moms to understand that a thought leads to a feeling leads to an action. And that's really kind of the backdrop of cognitive behavioral therapy, teaching moms how to intercept a thought before it leads to a feeling so that they can exercise that muscle more and more um, to, to interrupt the thought so that it doesn't lead to um, physical or emotional distress. And then DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, is, is really one of our favorites. And it's really this concept of how both things can exist at the same time. I started off by saying mothers are fed this myth of you're going to love every minute of it. You're going to love your baby unconditionally. It's going to be such a wonderful experience. And sometimes it feels like that. And sometimes it feels awful. And sometimes it feels like a mistake. And sometimes we, we can't believe that we got ourselves into this situation. And the whole concept behind DBT is that both feelings can exist. So oftentimes as human beings, we're conditioned to think you're only supposed to feel one way, when actually we could feel a whole range of emotions at the same time. And to be able to make space for that and recognize that that doesn't mean that you're a bad person or that you're doing anything wrong. It just means that humans are, are complex. And in so we are able to have these different feelings that can coexist. Um, and just a couple of other different modalities. We do art therapy. Uh, we do mindfulness and meditation with our moms. Um, and we also do trauma-informed yoga. Oh, and then I, I didn't mention, we do a partner support group. So we are really, really committed to making sure that partners are receiving care and also have a community to talk about what it's like for them in supporting their wife or partner who's experiencing a PMED. Next slide, please. Um, and so I've really covered most of this already, um, the different components and elements of the day program. Um, we start with a, a psychiatric assessment and really get a good sense of mom's symptoms and how acute, acute they are. We come up with a treatment plan. We do safety planning. Um, they are meeting with their reproductive uh, ther uh, therapist or psychiatrist once or twice a week. They have have individual sessions with their therapist two or three times a week, family sessions. Uh, we have partners, moms of moms, dads of moms, as many family members that we can bring in to make sure that everybody's on board with mom's treatment plan. We collaborate with outside providers if mom has outside providers before she comes in. And as I mentioned, in our bricks and mortar location, we, we do have a nursery, which is the best place to be when you're having a crappy day. Um, we cannot provide childcare, unfortunately, virtually, but our nursery director, who's a baby whisperer, she does baby care while visits um, with moms as frequently as they want and answers any questions they have about feeding, eating, sleeping, anything that might be coming up. We have an after hour support line. We have somebody on call 24 hours a day in the event mom is, is experiencing a lot of distress. Um, and then when it is time for mom to leave, we do very rigorous discharge planning and make sure she has a treatment team that we can release her to um, when she's done with the program. Next slide. So I'm just gonna speed through the rest of these. Um, we also do offer individual therapy, medication management, and trying to conceive consultations for a lot of 
women out there that want to that want to try, start trying to have a baby that might be on medication and they're trying to figure out is it safe is it not we'll do these one-off consults and let women know what is in fact safe to continue taking while they are trying to conceive next slide um, we have expanded our support group portfolio, again, to try to meet women and families where they're at during this vulnerable time. Um, we have a PMAD support group that meets twice a week for new and expecting moms that is very, very popular. We have um, started another partner support group. We've done sleep support for new moms, uh, pregnancy during the time of COVID. We're running a miscarriage and loss support group. Uh, and we also have a 12-week series around healthy relationships, so helping a couple navigate this, transi this transition to parenthood. Again, all of these are virtual. Next slide. And then we have been launched a, a, a robust webinar series as well. Um, again, just trying to meet the needs and fill the gaps. Um, managing anxiety as a parent during this time, what to expect as a pregnant woman, the whole delivery experience in the hospital, uh, how to navigate your relationship with your partner under one roof right now, uh, and many other different topics that we're adding at least one or two every week. These webinars are $10, um, and if that is a hindrance, then we will waive the fee um, and are welcome any kind of new ideas of ways that we could, we could offer new outlets of information and specific topics. Next slide, please. Um, and then this is just an example of the efficacy of the day program. One of the things that we do and use for every woman coming in is something called the EPDS. It's the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale, and it's a screening instrument that is, um, that is designed to, to screen the acuity of symptoms, um, pr uh, predominantly depression. You can score as high as a 30. Most women come to us with about a 20.6. And when they do leave the day program anywhere from two to five weeks later, um, their score on average is about a 7.6. So we, we are able to prove the efficacy of this program and how drastically effective it is at reducing symptoms um, in a newer expecting mom. Next slide. And then I'll just breeze through these. These are some pictures of our bricks and mortar. Um, we are not, not hospital affiliated. We are standalone. Uh, we tried to create a space um, that was very warm, nurturing, feels like a living room. Um, this is our front office area on the left and, and an example of some of our offices on the right. Uh, next slide. And then this is the group room that I mentioned. There's actually a big rug on the floor now, so it's even warmer. Um, but this is where we conduct the day program um, when we're actually in a building, which hopefully someday we will all return to. Next slide. And then this is our favorite. This is the nursery. Um, we just, right before this happened, um, had to double the size of it because our, um, our cohort was increasing so rapidly. And so this, Nursery is now twice the size, so we can uh, provide care to twice as many babies. Next slide. Um, that's, that's all I have uh, for you today. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, please feel free to reach out to me directly at the email there. You can call the Motherhood Center directly at the 212 number. Um, if you have questions, if you yourself are struggling and you want to know if it is in fact a PMAD, if you know of somebody out there who could use help, um, just encourage them to give us a call. Nobody calls us without being connected to treatment and care. Um, that's really our, our number one priority. So thank you so much. Thank you, Paige. And our uh, Q&A will start. So we'd like to give you a little time to formulate your questions and type them into the chat box or send them to events at cwny.org. While you're formulating your questions, I'd like to see if um, you remember how Mariana guided us on the road to mental wellness. There were, there were two points that really stand out in my mind, and one starts with the letter H, that would be helping others. When, when we help others, we heal ourselves. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is such an easy way to cure ourselves when we help others. And the other one starts with the letter G. Gratitude. 
Gratitude. Gratitude. And we forget to be grateful. We're so focused on all that's going wrong. Of course, the media is focused on that because that's more interesting than what's going right. So we're bombarded with the media on the negative and we forget to be positive and, and just recall all that we have to be grateful for. So thank you, Marianne. And now moving on to Izzy. Izzy had a wonderful acronym, G-bombs. Could you recall any of those uh, uh, plant-based options that can lead to health? G would be greens. B, beans. O, onions and garlic. M, mushrooms. B, berries. And S, seeds and nuts. And we will get to a question. We have a question from our audience on, on beans. And also, Izzy mentioned that what is crucial for our bodies is what type of health, what organ is it that is the foundation of good health? Lung health, it's very important to be able to breathe properly and to fill our lungs to capacity. And Paige mentioned the acronym PMADS, P-M-A-D-S. And do you recall what that stands for? Perinatal mood and anxiety disorder. And what I found interesting, Paige, of the use of peri as a prefix, I'm used to it in perimenopausal. And that, in that way, it means before menopause and around menopause. But it's so interesting that perinatal includes a, up to a year after the delivery of your baby. So those hormone swings and, and what's going on in our bodies, it just doesn't end once the baby is born. So I thought that was crucial in your talk that perinatal could be up to a year after. And I know I personally had, uh, had difficulty in my first uh, delivery and I had postpartum depression. So uh, I think we need to get the word out. And there I was crying all alone, walking with the baby, crying my eyes out, no one to talk to. And so we're so glad that we have a safe, safe space in your organization to, to share how we're feeling. Thank you. Also, Paige mentioned that there are a large number of women who experience PMOD. Do you recall that ratio? It's one in five women, 20%. That is a very high percentage for women who feel all alone and who may have these ideations and these angry feelings or total depression. Uh, so we do need to reach out and let people know. And I, I'm guessing that in this age of quarantine and isolation, that your organization is very much needed because these women are even more isolated. And also Paige mentioned a wonderful tool to measure. It's EPDS, Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale. Not only does it measure what these women are going through and how they've improved for your organization, but it helps someone going through something to be able to measure. We're not crazy. Oh, it can be measured. That means it happens a lot. So uh, thank you for sharing that tool. We need to know how to measure so that we can have empathy for ourselves, as Mariana said. It's healing to have empathy for ourselves and for others, and a measurement tool helps us with that. So now I'd like to move to the questions in our chat box. We have a question from Evelyn for Izzy. Can you repeat the fruit with sugar and fiber? Sure. So the main intake that I use from fruit, um, blueberries being, and blackberries being my favorites. Blueberries being the best for antioxidants, blackberries being the best for the amount of fiber. And so any of these beans, raspberries, blueberries, blackberries, acai, all of these berries have tons of fiber, which allows you to burn those sugars over a long period of time, gives you better energy and is less likely to turn to fat, less likely to spike your insulin, 
all of the good things that you want. Um, I recommend berries actually as one of the biggest bodybuilding foods. People would never think about it that way, but that's what I, that's what I recommend. Thank you for sharing that, Izzy. Something I learned a long time ago, there's a, a graded uh, level of um, nutrition and, and digestion where if we drink orange juice, it, it doesn't have the fiber. If we drink orange juice with a lot of pulp, it has more fiber. And I find I have, I have fewer stomach aches from the acid. Sure. If I eat an orange, then I have no stomach ache from the acid. And I'm guessing that fiber helps with the sugar and what you're saying, but it helps with digestion too. So fiber is key. And I think too often we take fiber out in the processing of food. So we have to be careful about processed foods. The fiber is gone. Agreed. So thank you. We have another question for Izzy. Um, Winterflower asks, are there low carb substitutes for beans for diabetics? You know, um, yeah, I, there are some variances in legumes and beans. Um, chickpeas are going to have more carbs than, let's say, soy, I suppose. Um, there's a lot of, of course, misinformation and scaremongering around soy. Um, I, I, I'm happy to provide you with a list of, of, of different foods if you want to contact me. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I really don't have memorized the exact ratio of carbs to fat, you know, the macronutrient ratio of different beans. But, but I would lean more towards soy and black beans and away from things like chickpeas. Uh, Izzy, what I learned a long time ago as a cancer survivor, and uh, it was hormonally related, I had to be careful about soy in a very processed form. It can have a hormone-like um, effect on the body. But the mo more pure it is, again, you're given fiber if you eat the actual bean. And... Um, and if it has less carbs, then it is a good recommendation. But I want, to, I want to caution the aud audience about processed soy. A lot of the evidence has also changed recently about how phytoestrogen um, you know, reacts in the human body. It does not act like mammalian estrogen, of course. Um, and there's been a very different stance taken recently about the effect of soy as really Breast cancer. Thank you. So please do your own research and please go to very reputable sources. Uh, would you recommend some of the sources? I guess, um, is it NIH? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of discussion at the World Health Organization um, re regarding that. NIH is probably very good. If you are in your City, I highly recommend Brooklyn Nurse Practitioners Clinic. They're heavily um, influenced by plant foods, and rather than just writing another script, using lifestyle interventions and nutritional interventions that, that have no side effects. So, yeah, NIH and, and WHO are great, great as well. And Winterflower has another question. And disabled individuals may not be able to perform some of the exercises you described. Would you recommend Tai Chi and Qigong? Would that be beneficial for those of us who cannot do certain forms of exercise? Sure, those are good recommendations. Um, I would like to give an additional recommendation called Iyengar Yoga. BKS Iyengar is one of mm -hmm. the main who popularized yoga in the West, and the Iyengar Institute in Manhattan has a list of classes specifically meant for people with disabilities, for people with back problems, very specific, a class for people with scoliosis, a class for people with all different kinds of things. And Iyengar is also the one who popularized all the additional tools that you'll see in yoga that are used for people with limitations. So the Iyengar Institute can provide you with things that you can do at home. Um, and yeah, Tai Chi and Qigong are also great ways to get yourself mobile, moving around, increase flexibility, get some blood flow happening. That'll work as well. 
Thank you, Izzy. Now we have two questions for Mariana from uh, anonymous attendees. It has been really taxing to be stuck in home with my family all the time. I'm wondering how I can transform the feelings of anxiety they sometimes incite into the growth piece of the chart that you shared. And so this is a two part question. Also, where can I find the chart? It seemed really helpful. I can answer the second part. That will be on our website um, 15 minutes after the presentation, cwny.org. I will remind you all at the end of this session where you can find Mana's chart. So Mariana, again, um, I'm wondering how I can transform the feelings of anxiety they sometimes incite into the growth piece of the chart, chart you shared. Thank you for that question. It was part of the um, uh, part of my focus that I wasn't able to share. Um, besides planned activities that you know I had talked about, um, which may be more available to people, there are certain techniques that um, Paige mentioned and Izzy had mentioned that. Uh, are useful to transform and take the anxiety in that moment, the anxieties of fear. Um, and they are mindfulness, grounding techniques, affirmations, and meditation, none of which have to be complicated and to keep it simple and doable. Mindful techniques, um. technique might be able to use our thoughts to actually turn our attention to what we are doing and what we are saying. And it automatically has a reaction of, of reducing the anxiety. I'm gonna give you some examples. Uh, if you're in home, in your home, and you're not able to get out, let's say go or, or you're in, you know, to be able to access me, you can do this anywhere by utilizing, observing your senses, sight, hear, sound, taste, um, touch. Okay, so how to's. In this day of, we're washing our hands all the time. You know, so while you're washing your hands, get in touch with what that feels like. They observe the feeling of touch and what it feels like for the water to go through your hands. Maybe the smell of the soap if you're cooking. And you are taking the time to observe what it's like, what it tastes like. Grounding techniques are exactly that, observing what it feels like to ground yourself when your thoughts are racing, to pause and be still and put yourself in the present moment. Because as I was indicating the attention, we, we give attention to things that build momentum. And it's about turning away from that as well. Um, begin to utilize affirmations, um, those statements, I am whole and loved in hope I am fearless. Um, using our breath, Izzy had mentioned the breath. In the five second hold, the five second release, second hold out. And these are things that are doable, they are money. Uh, you can uh, take, they don't take a lot of time. If uh, you can also, which I want to highly recommend, which works for me, is when that anxiety is reaching a very high level. Um, there are visual guided meditations, but you can combine your breath with an affirmation. And I even do this. I, I uh, encourage my patients to do this. We do this together. About what it means for you to breathe. and visualize that. And we, one of my favorites is breathe in the word let and out go. These are things within your control and your choice, which is where mental health, you have that power to do that, even though it doesn't always feel like that at the moment, reaching out to somebody who can maybe help you with that thought process. Um, and the other thing with these techniques, which is wonderful, the more you uh, or the increase you have and then growth zone 
that we want to get to becomes like an internal compass. And when we're off a little, we can recall those words, these techniques. Um, and if you can just add one thing to your toolbox or, or whatever visual you want to create for your mental health, you can just one thing, one idea, one concept, you've begun to change the way you feel, change the way you think, and, and become part of your mental well pelvis. I don't know if that, hello? Hi, Maria. Oh, thank you. I thought that. I lost you again. It freezes. I'm sorry. <laughs> there is something else. In okay, there is something else I want to add, and I want, you know, that's important. Um, is that, you know, in this time of uncertainty, all of us are essential. And, and you had mentioned that as well, that through our pain and suffering and isolation and everything that everyone is going through, um, we can always help somebody else. And to, there is, um, wherever you are, if you're isolated in your house or you're able to get out, there is always um, of service that we can be to ourselves and to others. So true. And, and I certainly I'm reachable as well. If, if I'm getting cut, if someone wants to further talk about this, I am accessible and reachable. I think we've lost uh, Mariana. Can you hear me, Mariana? You now, you're going in and out. Yeah, you're going in and out also. So uh, we will have all of the presenters' contact information on the PowerPoint slide at cwny.org past events. I don't see any other questions. And Mariana asked, answered mindful and meditation techniques in her other response. So if we could uh, move to the next slide. A big thank you to our expert panelists, Mariana Zara, Izzy Jacobus, and Paige Bellenbaum. We really appreciate your donating your time to our organization and to our attendees. And we hope you've all learned something I know I did. Thank you again for giving us your time. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now our, our executive director, Michelle Downs, has put together some resources for you. And uh, we highly promote New York City well. New York City has a wonderful uh, set of mental health resources. And uh, our city government has put a big focus on mental health. Wouldn't you say that, Mariana? Oh, it's okay. You're muted. You're muted. Hello. Yeah, I see that now. Oh, absolutely. There's a plethora of resources. I'm glad that you did that. I didn't have time to get to that in my, in my talk. Um, and I encourage everybody, you know, your inner life and take the time to do that. Um, reach out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, then we have uh, resources for nutrition and exercise. And uh, World Health Organization is one of them, Izzy. Yeah, I see. It's good. Yeah. So please do visit these, these uh, links. And then we have resources for perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Next slide. So uh, we do have an event coming up, Women in the Military, 
Um, May is Military Appreciation Month, and we do want to honor the women who are uh, in our in service for our country. And we will have a, a women artist exhibit coming up, as well as a trafficking panel discussion. And on a happy note, we will have uh, our walking group resuming at Fort Tatton uh, in Bayside. It's a beautiful, beautiful park. And uh, when the government gives us the okay, we will be walking together. And please do join our book club. And we do offer a caregiver's phone support group on Wednesdays, but we are flexible if the needs are at other times or other days. Our uh, licensed uh, master social worker is available and is flexible. We do offer conversational English as a second language class, and uh, we do offer it by phone now, um, but it will be, uh, again, an in-person class when, when we are out of our um, quarantine. And we look forward to our computer classes and our legal clinic, and we continue to refer uh, women who call in and, and uh, email us to whatever their needs are. Next slide. So please help us continue providing these educational programs. If you'd like us to continue these webinars, please uh, visit our website at cwny.org slash donations. Or if you'd like to become a member, and at this time, uh, please consider a basic membership. But if you are a professional or a small business, please consider those membership levels. And once again, this PowerPoint will be on our website in a, a little while, in about 15 minutes, at uh, cwny.org, past events. Next slide. So thank you so much. We hope you learned something. Please stay in touch with us. And again, thank you to Mariana, Izzy, and Paige. We learned so much from you. Thank you for your time. And uh, we'll, we'll be visiting your websites. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a nice afternoon. You too. Bye now.